So let's welcome our panel to the stage panel. If you could uh, uh, join me here, watch your step, please, and then we will start. And while they're coming on the stage, I think I'll just go through the introductions now to save some time. You've already heard quite a bit about uh, Tom Beebe. Um, uh, just to recap, obviously he is the recipient of the 2013 Driehaus, um, uh, Richard H. Driehaus Prize at the University of Notre Dame. He's chairman emeritus of HBRA Architects, where he spent more than 40 years as director of design. Um, feel free to have a seat, folks. Uh, Tom was steeped in architecture from his earliest days, which is one of the things we learn in the film. He could look out his bedroom window in um, River Forest, Illinois, and see the roof of the Frank Lloyd Wright designed house next door. Uh, his grandfather actually was a, an engineer in the concrete, the, the newfangled technology of sprayed concrete, and worked with Frank Lloyd Wright and Tom remembers his uh, grandfather grousing that Wright always owed him money. Uh, and it, as part of this film, we were really fortunate to travel around. We, it was amazing to be a fly on the wall in Tom's class at Yale. Uh, and, and we got to see that he is really multilingual when it comes to design. And we had a crew down in Tuscaloosa looking at the courthouse that looks like it was sort of airlifted there from ancient Greece or Rome. Um, and then we went and saw the hole in the wall gang that he designed for Paul Newman in Connecticut. Saw that amazing Tuscan villa that you momentarily saw there. Harris Theater in Chicago, a very wide range of, of designs and we'll talk about that in the panel. Um, David Watkins is an acclaimed architectural historian. Uh, like Tom, he has dared to challenge the modern orthodoxy. His provocative book, Morality and Architecture, boldly challenges the assertion that modernism was rational and truthful and that it reflected the actual needs of contemporary society. And then the other two folks here on the stage with us, I'll give a little more introduction to. Um, Stuart Cohen was perhaps Stanley Tigerman's first recruit in the radical Chicago 7 group uh, or maybe you two cooked it up together, you'll have to clarify that. Um, uh, Stewart uh, contributed much of the research and writing to the catalogs for the Chicago 7, which could almost be read as um, manifestos. Um, he's a principal with Stuart Cohen and Julie Hacker Architects, and Julie's here. Um, uh, they specialize in high-end homes steeped in historic and traditional design. Stewart trained at Cornell under Colin Rowe a year after Tom or ahead of Tom? He's older, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, and let's see, start in your early career, uh, worked with uh, Philip Johnson and Richard Meyer. Work has been widely published, he has many awards, and he's also a really a legendary teacher at the University of Illinois at Chicago and around the country. Melissa Del Vecchio is a partner at Robert A. M. Stern Architects, where she has worked since 1998. Um, some of you may remember Melissa from our documentary about Bob Stern. She's the one who sat me down in an office chair, rolled me underneath this model of the Yale Residential Colleges, which she's the project architect for, so that I could poke my head up through an, a gap that they affectionately call the Bob Hole, which allows Bob to get a quadrangle eye view of the, uh, of the whole model. Um, she also is project architect for a new business school at Notre Dame, so she's perfectly suited to both of these uh, assignments because she's a graduate of the Notre Dame School of Architecture and did her graduate studies at Yale where Tom Beebe was one of her professors. Um, she's currently commuting between New York and China working on a project for Robert A.M. Stern Architects and in fact flew directly to Chicago from China uh, Thursday so remember for Melissa it is currently um, 1130 at night right now and we'll take that into consideration. So welcome to our panel. So Tom, I'd like to start with you. Um, the Driehaus Prize is an award that honors practitioners of traditional and classical architecture. But in, in our documentary, you really talked quite um, vividly about how you kind of oppose this doc, doc, sort of dichotomy, this what, what you even call like a false dichotomy between sort of modern and classical. And, and there was a quote in there where you say that you've spent your, your whole life, really, trying to make architecture all one thing. Um, I don't know if you remember saying that, but if you do, uh, can, can you talk about why that's so important to you? Well, yeah, I think, I think architecture is a discipline. I think it's, it's an ancient discipline, and therefore it's based 
on a lot of things that are historical, and you actually have to understand the historical base in order to, to actually do meaningful architecture. And I think that every period has changed over the centuries. It's, it's a long, long history. And I think you know, the last 100 years is part of the history. And I think that everyone who practices architecture has to know what happened in the last 100 years, just like they have to know what happened in the last 1,000 years. So um, I think the idea of splitting it into two warring factions who then endlessly fight over the turf seems like a very, uh, a very uh, sort of wasteful way to spend your time, a, waste, a wasteful way to spend your energy. And I think in the end it's destructive to the discipline because I think what we should be doing is actually trying to figure out what are the commonalities of all great architecture rather than picking things apart on some minor sort of stylistic difference is my take on it. And I, I recall from reading your oral history that you did with the Chicago Art Institute, Colin Rowe was very influential in that? Colin Rowe was uh, a major teacher of mine. He also, because he, he was sort of the, the, uh, the brains behind the Cornell operation, he, uh, his influence was felt through the entire faculty. So we were always presented with, with the notion of precedent, historical precedent. We were always asked to look at things to try to see what it might have to do with our design process. This was often sort of an arcane process. But it actually, by doing that, you learned a lot of things. I think Stuart could probably speak uh, very cogently about it, probably more than I can. Well, but. and one of the things I remember from that is, is that you were really struck by the fact that he you know, in, in included in architectural history people like Corbusier and uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Bauhaus, that these, these, these were part of the, right, the continuum of architectural history? Well, they were. I mean, Colin was actually very smart about how he did that because to have actually suggested literal precedents at that point in time, I don't think would have, would have worked. But the idea was that <coughs> you could look at history as a kind of repository of valid ideas and solutions that had some relationship to what architects should be doing or were trying to do today. So uh, the whole I the, the idea that all of that was available for us to look at and understand, it was all presented at a certain level of abstraction, but I think that, that the idea that that's all available is, was, was really kind of revolutionary. I, I think that while Vince Scully was clearly uh, keeping history alive in his teaching and interesting people at Yale, it was Colin and the other faculty there who were actually looking at all of these buildings analytically for the kind of lessons and principles. You know, it's like, uh, you know, you could put Frank Gehry's Bilbao and Frank Lloyd Wright's wing spread up on a screen together in a lecture and point out that they're both pinwheel plans and that they're not only pinwheel plans but as kind of bizarre buildings, each arm of the pinwheel is uniquely different. Obviously the Gary building omits one arm because of the river but you know they're, they're really kind of the same idea and the minute you get that then a whole new world of architecture and possibilities really opens up to you. So, I want to, David Watkin, I want to bring you in on this. So, it's an interesting segue where you say a whole new world of possibility. Um, David, you've, you've had some pretty strong things to say about modernism, and to my way of understanding it, sounds like uh, one of your um, problems with modernism is that it's sort of um, or, or the way it's been interpreted or taught is that it, it kind of excludes possibilities. Um, I, I just got to pull a couple of quotes from you. In Morality and Architecture, you quote, actually you quote Prince Charles as saying, post-war planners and developers did more damage to our cities than the wartime bombing by the Luftwaffe. <laughs> and not to be outdone by Prince Charles, you yourself wrote in a book called Radical Classicist about Quinlan Terry, um, that the modernism with which Quinlan Terry has had to battle is like the Taliban, a puritanical regime. That is strong stuff. Well, it's, yeah, it's great enemies that, that, um, that we have to fight. I mean, What's that? The, well, the enemies we have to, to, to fight are very, very powerful in England, and I, I'm not so familiar with the situation here, but in England, 
to do anything classical is regarded as just grotesquely out of place and indeed immoral. So these people are very, very rigid in their beliefs. That is what I was comparing them in, in a uh, perhaps over-exaggerated gesture with, with the Taliban. You know, it is a total rhetoric. It is absolutely dominant. If you go out of a school of architecture in England and you design a building with a molding on it, you will be rejected. Mm -hmm. Indeed, if you do that when you're at the school, you'll be thrown out of the school. I mean, it is, it is a totalitarian world that the architects have created. And it, it, even though we now do have classical buildings and traditional buildings being put up, they are not recorded in the architectural press. They don't really get the same kind of publishing and... Um, They're just ignored. ignored. They don't want to know about it. It's incredible. Well, that's a good segue to you, uh, mm -hmm. Melissa, because y you said to me on the phone in a conversation that you kind of feel like the, the generation that sort of dared to practice classical architecture that came before you, uh, Bob Stern, Tom, uh, really, really forged a, a trail that made your life a lot easier. Would that be fair to say? Well, that made my education very different, right? Because I was able then to, to study in an environment where there was some validity to looking at classicism and to looking at history in an even uh, deeper and more direct way than maybe Stuart's experience at Cornell and opened up, I think, a wider, a wider range of possibility. And I think that my generation has a lot to say thank you to, to these laureates on the stage and to the 10 years past mm -hmm. for opening up those possibilities. Yeah, I wrote down a line that you said, which I thought was so interesting, um, that it, 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 for you, it was presented as a reasonable choice to yes. practice classical architecture. And that's really different from how it had been historically? Well, in I your, think it's in your different than the experience that these folks had when they were in school. And certainly when I went on to Yale, I was, I was more challenged to um, justify my position. But at the same time, it still, um, my fellow students did see a value to what I had taken from my undergraduate education and how I was able to become, I think, a, a strong problem solver by having a sort of more limited range of what I was looking at architecturally at Notre Dame, I think I became better at the problem solving aspects of being an architect so that when I then came to Yale and was exploring something different, I, I was better equipped, mm -hmm. I think, or well equipped, I should say, to explore those other ideas. One, one side note, because um, Notre Dame is such a big uh, presence here that I was fascinated by. You, Notre Dame actually wasn't a classical school of architecture when you started there. Can you say it's that? Not. I was us? just talking to Tom about this before. I was the very first class to go through Thomas Gordon Smith's program. And in fact, he was just hired as dean when I was a freshman. So that meant when I was looking at architecture schools, I didn't know what I was in for. And in fact, I went to Notre Dame because my father and my uncle had gone. There was a family tradition. Yeah. And I did a little research into the architecture school, but didn't know what I was headed for. So it was a bit of a surprise when I got there. And I actually asked you on the phone, well, when, when, when Thomas Gordon Smith took over and, you know, this is going to be a classical school, I said, did a lot of kids leave? And you actually said no, right? There was, there was a bit of rebellion in that very, um, so he came when I was a freshman and the freshman curriculum stayed the way that it had been years prior and he really started with the sophomores. Mm. And that sophomore class did rebel a little bit. I don't think that anyone actually left. Um, but then my class sort of saw what they were learning and I think we were, we were a bit more willing participants mm -hmm. in, the, mm -hmm. in the process. Um, let's, uh, go ahead, Stuart. No, it's just worth saying about Notre Dame that uh, prior to Thomas Gordon Smith going there, uh, it had been sort of Cornell. Yeah. Stephen Hurt was there, Norman Crow were there. There were people who had been educated at Cornell who looked at architecture exactly. in a certain uh, uh, analytic way who were basically in control of the curriculum. So it was kind of primed to go in that direction. Yeah, I think some of those people fit in quite well to what, what Thomas brought to it, and certainly Norman Crow was one of my influential professors there as well. Let's talk about the, um, the Chicago 7. Uh, are, are any of the other Chicago 7 here? I didn't get a chance to see. There are, are six of the Chicago 7 are still, um, still around, and 
uh, and several of them, Cynthia Weiss, who you saw in this uh, film, was, was a later addition to the Chicago 7. Um, Thomas, Tom, uh, what was that all about? What was going on in Chicago when you got here? Well, um, when I got here, the city was, was mainly large commercial <coughs> firms. So you had the firms that had come out of, the people had been trained by Mies, uh, all went to work in the offices. And uh, places like C.F. Murphy and Skidmore, Owens and Merrill had the majority of the, any major commission that was offered in Chicago was, was taken up by those firms. So there were smaller firms who, people like Harry Weiss were sort of trying to beat the system, but anything that wasn't be seen was very difficult to actually get through. The people who gave out the work, they just didn't give it to them. So um, I think, you know, we generally as a group, I mean, we're a very loosely fitting group. <laughs> you know, there wasn't a lot of, 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 of shared belief between us, actually. And, uh, but the one thing we didn't like <laughs> was we didn't like the grasp of these big firms on the entire, and, and, and you were, to, just to full disclosure, you were at one of those big firms. Yeah, I was at one of those firms, yeah. C.F. Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was very personal, you're right. Um, but you know, I mean, it was the whole thing, I mean, it's architecture, I, I must say, architecture as a, as a profession uh, isn't very generous, and, and uh, people don't help other people along and when people get a hold of the work base, they don't tend to try to spread it around with other people. So there's a kind of, there, over the years I've come to understand there's a kind of mean-spirited aspect about the profession, which is actually not good. It um, makes good television, however. It makes good television, <laughs> yes. Controversy is terrific. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, I think that the profession uh, suffers from, from this kind of, uh, really isolation from the rest of activities. I mean, you're taught at an architecture school. I mean, there you are in the architecture school working day and night, and everybody else in the university sort of looks on and sees the lights there. And, and at Cornell, they used to come, when they heard a project was due, people would come, like going to the zoo. You could watch these people run around and do crazy things. And, uh, you know, I think that aspect of the profession is not great. And, and I think also the kind, kind of meanness uh, that's exhibited is also not great. So. I think the current sort of debate, or it's not a current debate, it's the last hundred years, this thing with classicism and what else is around, could be Gothic or something else. It's all part of the same thing of trying to make space for yourself at the expense of another person. I think that is actually not a great instinct. And I think that's, it's kind of a survivor instinct which you develop in architecture, which I think is, is not productive. And I think one of the things we tried to do with Chicago 7 was to have an open debate discuss things across the board and anybody with an opinion could offer an opinion. Um, I don't think that lasted too long, if my memory was. I think that the debate then became sort of on party lines and it was less interesting. There was a moment, though, when it was pretty interesting, I would say. I don't know if Stuart would have another. Yeah, Stuart, what do you, uh, can you weigh in? <laughs> How much history do you want? <clears throat> I mean, well, it, uh, well, you know, I, I it's, it's interesting because the Chicago 7 really came out of, uh, uh, was a follow-up to an exhibit that Stanley and I did called Chicago Architects. And that was the polemic. That was, hey, let's look at Chicago. In fact, there's a breadth of work and ideas here that goes beyond the party line. And the party line was uh, structure and ultimately Mies. And I will and say, we, we didn't include this in our documentary because it was just too much for a, a general audience, but <clears throat> that exhibit, Chicago Architects, that you and Stanley did, was in itself a kind of a, a response to another exhibit. And what was the big thesis well, the, the other, of this the, other exhibit that came to Chicago, the big claim that you were really just well, appalled it was, by? It was called The Hundred Years of Chicago Architecture, and it basically took up the sort of European modernist argument that this was all a kind of seamless fabric that went from, you know, early Chicago back to Chicago via Mies and then to SOM. Somehow or other, Frank Lloyd Wright and a lot of, and Richardson and people that didn't quite fit but who you couldn't quite ignore got tied into that. And that was, in a funny way, kind of offensive. And well, and there was a line, right, that nothing of significance had happened in oh, Chicago yeah. Yeah, yeah, between... Yeah. It's, it's in Gideon, between the unfortunate 
1893 World's Fair and Mises' arrival in 1938. Nothing. Nothing had Nothing. happened so, in Chicago. So the idea was, in fact, to demonstrate that that, that was a fabrication, that that was a, a, a kind of a political lie, if you will. Um, I'm interested in, because this is all about Tom, I'm sort of interested in Tom at that point in time. I mean, Stanley said that, that uh, most of us ha in the seven had very little in common. Uh, what was interesting to me is that Tom, in fact, came to Chicago and worked within the Miesian tradition. And this is something that none of you know, but Alan Greenberg at a dinner with Carter Manny said that right out of school, he had come to Chicago and desperately wanted to work here, that he'd interviewed for Mies and that Mies wasn't hiring, and then he went and talked to Jack Bronson, and that Jack Bronson had just sent out the Civic Center for bids, and Murphy wasn't hiring at that point in time, so he turned around and left Chicago. And one can only wonder, A, why he wanted to work in that environment, and then B, what would have happened if he hadn't left Chicago. But I think it was the kind of rationalism uh, and the, the systemization of elements probably that attracted Tom, because Tom once said this absolutely brilliant thing to me. Tom was teaching at IIT. I was teaching at the University of Illinois, and I once said to Tom, Tom, what are you doing there? You know, why do you want to teach there? And he just looked back at me and he said, you know, I think it's better to teach the students something than to teach them nothing. And he said, at least the IIT graduates can go out and, and they can do, you know, Miesian buildings at a certain level, or they have something as a starting point that they can push against. Mm -hmm. Do you stand by that statement? Yeah, well, actually, I'd forgotten that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, I had the, the honor of being the only person. Well, I, there, no, I wasn't the only person, but I was in both of those shows. I had work in both shows. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, I was trying to sort, sort it out at the time. But I, I, think, I think that there is a, a, a curious thing about architectural education that whether, whether it's like a pure art form, like art school, you go to, you know, I used to go to art school crits at Yale. And, uh, and they always sort of amazed me because everybody just sort of sat around and looked at the things and then every once, it was like a seance kind of. And every, <laughs> one, every once in a while someone would say something and, and then somebody would respond to it. And, and, and this architecture can, school can be that too. I mean, that there is, I mean the, t the school at Yale tends to be, tends to be kind of art school-like, which is probably goes back to its origins where it started. And the arts at Yale were always grouped together. So there's a, a kind of tradition at Yale of, of architecture being an art form and, and it's justified in terms of its artistic merit and, and, and all the criticism and even people like Vince Scully, it all sort of fit together in a way. And everybody was sort of trying to have their moment where they could do something and they would do something, of course, that would be wonderful. Uh, Cornell was a little different. Cornell was a little like boot camp. I mean, it was, it was tough at Cornell because, you know, they, you know, they brought you in the first day, there were 60 people there, and they said, you know, look to your right, look to your left, the other person won't be there. And you, you know, you thought this was just some kind of statement, you know, and then you went up, you counted the desks in the drafting rooms, and there were 60 downstairs, and at the top there were 15, and it was like, <laughs> that was it. That, you know, they never changed the desks. So you figured out, wow, this is tough. You know, there's only, only gonna, a quarter of us gonna get through here. And, you know, we all went through this kind of system and uh, nobody wanted to leave. No one ever left voluntarily at Cornell. It was, they were sort of, you know, they were forced out. You were, you were flunked out because you didn't get do well in the design studio. So there was a kind of um, discipline to that, that that actually didn't exactly translate into the architecture. There, there was, I mean, it, at Cornell there was always this thing about your, everyone was trying to do kind of perfect things and they were trying to outdo everybody else doing more perfect things. But what perfect was, wasn't, wasn't so clear. And Colin, I don't think, added any clarity in that area. But it, it was obviously a tradition within the school. And IIT, uh, to its credit, it, it was an amazing school because uh, they started over again thinking about what architecture is. And uh, it, it sounds sort of crazy today what they did, but they, they did have amazing things they did there. In the, in, the, in the visual training, you start out with visual training, which was the old Bauhaus course, but they revamped it in Chicago. 
and it started out with, you started out and you took a pencil, a wooden pencil, ordinary wood, wooden pencil, you had to sharpen it with a, with a pocket knife, and then you had to draw four lines the same length, the same thickness, all impossible, like it's impossible craft. And out of that, there was, a, there was, a, there was an attempt to actually do, do things that were really perfect, not just conceptually perfect, but actually physically perfect. And I, and I think that's, that's very closely tied to the notions of, of the Beaux-Arts method of, of teaching, mm. those amazing drawings where you had, to, you had to actually master technique exactly, otherwise they didn't work out. And I think that level of craft at IIT actually was an amazing thing. And it was the closest thing I can think of is was sort of the Beaux-Arts method as it, was, as it was taught in France. Um, so, you know, I think the idea of characterizing uh, s certain things and dismissing whole movements and whole schools based on, you know, some <coughs> idea of, of stylistic preference, I think is a crazy thing to do. I think you actually have to look things really carefully <coughs> and, and try to figure out what really is of value, yeah. in my sense. Uh, David Watkin, I want to bring you back in here for, uh, we're, we're actually, believe it or not, we're almost close to the end of the allotted time, uh, but uh, I want to hold for one moment because Melissa, uh, 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 I know I caught you off guard there, sorry. Um, you, this really segues into something else that you said to me on the phone, which was that um, you had this certain training, we're talking about training here, these different comparative schools. You had a certain kind of training at Notre Dame, uh, but you really felt the need to go to Yale. Why? What, what, what was your agenda after having finished five years, you know, getting your architecture training, why did you want to go to a different school? I really appreciated what I was able to learn about the classical language, but I felt like there was, there was always an other that I didn't understand, and, and maybe the same way that um, Stuart was saying that the IIT students, at least they learned something that they could, they could push against. And I, I felt like I had this wonderful baseline of an education, but I needed to understand the other, and I needed to be able to communicate more broadly in the architectural community, and if I continued to choose to do classicism, I would know better why. I was why Yale it. in particular? Um, I only applied to a couple of different schools, actually, mm -hmm. and I, I think it was because I understood Yale as being a place where, where students were encouraged to sort of find themselves and do their own thing, as opposed to Harvard, which seemed to be just a, another way another of teaching. Another very doctrinaire. A yeah. very doctrinaire sort of thing that Yale actually allowed more of a multiplicity of discussion. And is that where you met Tom? That is where I met Tom, yes. And what was Tom's... Um, contribution or role in, in that quest of yours? Well, Tom was sort of the perfect professor for me because, of course, he understood exactly what I knew and exactly what I didn't know. Huh. And so he was able to kind of help me fill in the gaps. And he was joking with me earlier that he wouldn't dare let me do any classicism in his studio because uh, he knew that I was there for something else. Yes, but, you told me the, uh, what was the assignment in the studio? It was the IIT Student Center. We were doing it at the same time that the competition was going on that, of right. course, Rem Koolhaas won. And of course, right, as we know, Rem Koolhaas designed that um, wild uh, student center there. And there's nothing better than having a Chicago studio with Tom because there's no better teacher for Chicago. Uh -huh. Good. I wanted your input on this whole comparative schools question. David, um, before we run out of time, another thing that I found in, in your writing that I thought was very interesting was, uh, and you alluded to a little bit in your initial comment, um, the, this is, I believe, a quote, the public widely understands this damage wrought by the modernist city, what, what we alluded to earlier, the Luftwaffe quote, um, but that the architecture profession is still fundamentally believes in it, in the modernist view. Um, that was written in 2001, so that's 12 years ago. Um, and I, you know, and all of you can weigh in on this too. Do you feel that's still the case, or is, is, has, has there, is there now more room for classical architecture? No. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the architectural establishment the Royal Institute of British Architects, all those bodies are totally opposed to anything being done traditionally. You can't add on to an existing old building in anything other than a modernist, ideally glass boxed 
style. I mean, it is, it is absolutely extraordinary. It, it is totally um, unchanged. What's it going to take to change that? Well, I've been trying for many years. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got very far. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the, the public, uh, uh, Bob Adam uh, has conducted polls of um, English people showing them photographs of houses which would you like to live in? Even if they get a classical, you know, Georgian looking house or a modernist one, I mean, 90% of the public will go for something traditional, and I'm sure that the same is the case over here. Um, but that doesn't oddly affect the education of architects. They go out of schools of architecture not knowing how to do the simplest thing which most people want. If you, when you buy an old Victorian house, it's been wrecked by the modernists, all the cornices have been taken out. These young architects couldn't possibly design a cornice. They are incapable of doing what the public wants. Is, is this, uh, for the other, I mean, is, this, is this really more of a problem in England? I mean, is this your yes. experience? It, yes, yes, so I mean, no, I, no, I just no, I don't, don't know. No, no, I think it's no. a problem here too. I it's mean, a I, huge I, problem I understand here. that having, having tried to do a little work in England, it is a big problem there. But here, there's the, I mean, the issue here, there's things like our courthouse in, in Alabama, that, you know, that, uh, to sneak that by the GSA would, is almost impossible. I mean, that, <laughs> that was actually done through the political will of people in power who wanted that courthouse. Otherwise, when you go through the, the GSA mechanism of getting chosen by a peer, a peer review group, of which none are interested in classical architecture at all, the chance of getting chosen is almost nothing. Uh, and then when you get there, the GSA staff goes after you for not doing a modernist building. They've, written, they've rewritten the, uh, the, the GSA is interesting. If you go through and you read their, their description of what a public building should be, you know, it starts out um, up through the 30s and 40s, it talks about being monumental, being, being um, uh, you know, having a kind of a, a, a presence to itself. It describes classical public buildings, which the, the things in the 30s, like the post office and things are amazing, the courthouses. And then, and then they slowly, it slowly e evolves into, the wording starts to change. And now, and now it says that, you know, that, it, that it's, it's of our time, whatever that means. Oh. And then it, it, that's, it's that whole argument. And David's right, the whole thing, when you add on the buildings here, the, the Secretary of the Interior's requirements, you can't add on to a building in a traditional style, that's forbidden. So. The federal Expressly government. Expressly forbidden? Yeah, the federal government has a position against traditional and classical architecture, and it's, it's in writing. I mean, I, th yep. I think it's clear that that's what, what it's all about. And yet, if, if, as you say, the majority of the public would prefer it, I mean, doesn't the market demand it? I mean, no. where do you get your customers from? If you're the customers, you know, yeah, well. It's what, it, it's what Tom was saying. You know, architecture schools educate their students to be elitist. You know, we all know better, right? Frank Lloyd Wright said that the architect is the savior of American culture here and forever, two to, four, two to four. And I think that most students come out and actually just think that way, you know? And I, what, what David said last night about the modernists in England having really hijacked to a certain extent public opinion, but certainly the profession is doubly true here. I mean, years ago when the Driehaus Prize started, Blair Kamen said to me, our Pulitzer Prize winning uh, uh, architectural critic said to me that one of these days he was gonna have to do an article on the alternate universe of people who, of architects who do traditional architecture. And I think the problem is that, you know, in spite of the fact that this is a parallel to the Pritzker Prize, you know, people know who the Pritzker Prize, what the Pritzker Prize is, and the Driehaus Prize is somehow part of this alternate universe. And it just isn't true. Most architects practicing architecture today, you know, if they're, uh, well, 24% of AIA members are sole practitioners. We don't know how many are in smaller two to five person firms. I think 90% of those firms are doing residential architecture and they're almost all doing traditional architecture. So even the, the profession fails to, uh, to acknowledge the reality of who their members are and what most of their members are doing. 
And just, Melissa, as someone who is at an earlier stage in your career, are, are you experiencing, do you feel this way too? Or do you, do you feel like in your personal experience, you are finding more room for a kind of architecture that you want to practice? Everything everyone's saying is, is very much true, but I think I feel like there should be room for, for both. And there's a funny quote from Stanley Tigerman later in your piece that says something like, if the Martians landed in the US, they'd be confused by all these buildings that are not of their time. And I kind of question whether the Martians would be more confused in a world where every building every year was of its time than if there was some continuity of mm. tradition and sense of, sense of place within which there's always an opportunity for a foil, for a Bilbao, for something like that. But without some continuity, you sort of lose all sense of place in my mind. Mm. And that's an important component. Well, I believe that we've run out of time, uh, right? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, can we please thank our, our panel?